Hello, friends. My name is Eric Ting. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am a Chinese American with glasses, short cropped hair, black shirt, I'm sitting in a, a white room, which just happens to be my mother's bedroom. I am the artistic director of California Shakespeare Theater in the Bay Area. I want to take a moment at the very top to acknowledge um, first that uh, many of us in the Bay Area um, are gathered on Ohlone land, uh, the Bruns Amphitheater, which is the home of California Shakespeare Theater. But because this is a virtual space, it's also important to recognize that many of us are not in the same space, that we're meeting here in this kind of virtual landscape. Uh, but one thing that all of you can do is to take a moment to research um, the, the land on you stand um, at this moment. Uh, we also want to take a moment to acknowledge that uh, land acknowledgements are merely just the beginning of the work that we can do um, to acknowledge uh, that the that the space that we inhabit, that many of us call home, um, was colonized and was taken uh, from our indigenous um, fellows. And uh, so if you are interested, um, one thing that we like to do at CalShakes is to mention the Segorite land tax, um, which is a tax that you can pay um, for uh, your time and space uh, on the land that you inhabit. Um, so this is uh, Cal Shake's direct address series. Um, and the panel that you all are attending today is the second in our allyship and anti-racism series. You know, ever since we had to cancel the season as a consequence of the pandemic that shut down many of our um, theaters, uh, you know, we've been asking a question at Cal Shakes, which is, uh, what is a theater when you can't make theater? Um, and what we've aspired to do is to create spaces um, uh, where uh, our, our friends and our colleagues um, and our co-travelers uh, can experience brave conversations around the issues that are confronting us today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce both our, our modern evening, but also sort of one of the cornerstones of our artistic team here at California Shakespeare Theater. Uh, that is our artistic producer, S.K. Rastis. S.K.? Hi. Thank you, Eric. Hi. Welcome, everyone. There's 195 people here together, and we can see none of you, which continues to be pretty, um, pretty wild. I um, want to offer a deep thank you for joining the conversation tonight. Again, my name is S.K. Um, I use they, them pronouns. Um, for access support for folks who can't see my, um, I am a white, long-haired trans person. I'm wearing a gray shirt with a gold chain. There's a window in part of my background and like a shelf and a poster of the sky in the other part of my background. Um, yeah, so I'm here to kick it off. We're gonna do about the first 20 minutes is gonna be sort of business and level setting and whatnot. And then um, we're gonna dive into the conversation. So, oh man, it's distracting to see people saying hi to me in the chat. <laughs> hi people. It's really great to have you here. Um, I wanna give a special thanks to um, Catherine and Jenna, our ASL interpreters, to Norma, um, who actually connected us to these ASL interpreters and who is setting up all of our ASL interpretation for the next few panels. Um, I want to thank Leanne Dowd, who's sort of stage managing this thing behind the scenes, um, Isabel Siragusa, who's running the chat, to Eric, who's also supporting, there's a web of labor sort of supporting this conversation um, that's happening. So I would love to visibilize that. Um, and a big thank you to our guest speakers who've come to join us. Uh, like I said, this first 20 minutes is going to be an intro. Please just, you know, bear with us as we get through um, some of this, just the foundation for what this conversation is going to be. Once we get into it, we'll do 30 minutes of um, more of like the panelist guest speaker conversation, and then we'll do 30 minutes open to um, everyone here. We're um, going to ask for uh, folks to engage in the Q&A at that point, but please hold your questions until we prompt you to do that. In the meantime, you can just use the chat however you want to. Um, 
And something that we're going to be trying out is actually live questions. So as you submit your question, we are going to actually invite you to speak it out loud. And don't want to do that, please like name that with your question. But otherwise, we're actually going to assume um, it's going to be voice to voice. Intentions behind that are to just connect and um, to really try to break through some of the barriers that, um, you know, the screens put up in this work. So cool, a couple other things. We're gonna be recording conversation. We are not sure if we're sharing it out yet. We're gonna see how it feels afterwards, get consent from anyone or everyone involved, uh, you know, a non-pressured consent. And if everyone feels good about it, then we'll be distributing it as a learning tool. Um, we're also going to follow up the conversation with an email that has um, any resource that is named in our conversation. So quote, organization, tool, what have you. We are collecting those and we will send those out. So if you miss something, no stress. Um, we'll get it. We're going to re-listen to the combo and track everything. Um, piece of sort of logistics business we are using this space and this collective attention to build awareness and ask for direct action towards the hashtag stop San Quentin outbreak campaign um, there is there are COVID outbreaks in every single California state prison right now it's not just San Quentin but know that um, the last you know few minutes are actually going to be dedicated to directing people towards action there's 205 people on here now that's actually like a lot <laughs> a lot of movement I would love to utilize this space especially a space talking about the work of white people to move us towards um, folks who are locked up right now and um, in in grave danger normally and now it's even more heightened um, cool gonna take a breath so these are just some general agreements both for our conversation as you know the panel and then also all together um, want to name that any overtly racist comments or live questions of the trolling nature will just be cut off deleted and muted no question. Um, one value that we want to lift up is that individually we don't know everything. Together we know a lot. I know we are, our voices, the folks on this panel are the ones that are being really lifted up in this conversation. That doesn't mean we are experts. I really want to interrupt that power dynamic um, as much as possible and just name that um, we're speaking from lived experience doing racial justice work and um, want to support everyone on this call in doing racial justice work. We welcome call-ins, disagreements, and multiple truths. Please don't feel afraid to, uh, this is for us as panelists and for folks asking questions. Yeah, if you disagree with, with what someone said or are confused or have a different you know, perspective, you know, bring it, yes and. We would love to engage with um, those kinds of comments as well. Um, <clears throat> we are also trying to interrupt um, white supremacy culture-isms such as urgency and perfectionism. We're not going to get to everything, but we are going to have a really um, hopefully connected and activated conversation. Um, Want to set that as, a, as an expectation. You know, we got, you know, 60 minutes to chat here. So um, lifting up, holding vulnerability as a value. Um, grounded in support and non-judgment and just asking for presence in this combo. And thank you so much for coming. We're so grateful to have you. I'm gonna pass it off to JD, who's uh, gracefully agreed to do a little grounding for us before we transition into the conversation. So JD, um, whenever you're ready. inviting you into this moment as we join together in this community join together with this intention towards unlearning white supremacy so taking a deep breath if that's available to you and on the exhale letting go and arriving arriving in your body just as it is. Taking a moment to notice 
the weight of your body on the earth, this connected body that we have connected to the earth and to each other. And with each breath connected to the universe, while we may be scattered all over in our little Zoom rooms, we are connected with the breath. and the planet and each other. So I want to invite you at any point to just, you know, take a breath during this to remember that as we listen, that we can listen from our whole body. So there's a potential there to think a lot. And so just coming into the body at any point, I don't even have to ring a bell. You can do that whenever it feels like a good thing to do. SK. Ooh, thank you for that invitation. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, accept <laughs> multiple times. Um, cool. Great. So let's get this combo started, huh? Um, I'm going to kick it off with some thoughts and then invite, um, invite the other speakers in. So here we go. White supremacy runs through the veins of this country. White supremacy upholds the systems. This country relies on the organizations, the dominant culture, our relationships, and our understanding of, you know, kind of where we are in the world a lot. And what I mean by that is that in all of these sort of intersecting layers of experience, um, white people are prioritized at the expense of black people, indigenous people, and people of color. Um, there is no denying this <laughs> anymore. We are in a moment of further unveiling how much this has been hi true historically and is true now. In our theater community in the Bay Area, we've seen multiple public accountability efforts in the past few years asking for theaters to make deep changes to transform this. I want to shout out the Coalition of Black Women Professional Theater Makers in the Bay Area for the work that they've done in in the past few years and more recently in the living document of POC experiences and Bay Area theater companies. On a national level, we have the hashtag we see you demands from, um, I'm going to say the term BIPOC is short for Black, Indigenous people and people of color. So the hashtag we see you demands from BIPOC theater professionals to white American theater Theater. We will be dropping those links in the chat. If you haven't checked that out and you work for an organization, <laughs> particularly a majority white organization, a legacy white organization, um, there is like an 18 page booklet of their demands. There is your roadmap right there. You know, so if folks are wondering, what do I do? It, there's been so much work to just sort of lay it out for us right in this very moment. Um, but yeah, theater makers, artists, professionals, and organizations are all grappling, grappling about what to do. And the conversation we're gonna have tonight is gonna be about the work that white people must do, unlearn white supremacy, you know, deprogramming, as Michael Robertson would put it, so we can support and be part of this necessary reckoning and transformation. And, you know, I'll just be real, like this is soul work. Like, White supremacy has dehumanized white people in so many ways too. We can't keep pretending that this is, we're not part of the picture, that this is happening to other people, not us, you know? Our humanity is at stake. And I feel like the deeper I dig, the more I realize how much white supremacy has, you know, robbed me of culture, connection, history, legacy, belonging, and truth. Like, you know, and this work um, can be deeply healing as well. Um, yeah, and we're worth it. We're worth this work. We've all been set up. So like, let's do it together. Um, for the convo tonight, um, 
I've curated this group of people that just honestly kind of selfishly personally inspire me in their presence as individuals and in their racial justice work in this world. Um, I put together an intentional mix of theater and non-theater people um, and we're going to have a combo. The first part is going to be just us. We're asking everyone to listen to it in the chat and then um, for the second half we'll be completing the circle and engaging with everyone who's joined tonight and really welcoming the Q&A and experimenting with these you know, live questions, almost like a call-in radio show or something like that. We'll see how it goes. If it's too clunky, you know, we'll go back to reading, but you know, we're all just so desperate to act right now that I'd love to give it a try. Cool. Um, with that, I'm just gonna open the circle a little wider and invite all these wonderful guest speakers into the space. Um, just asking folks to kick it off with a quick like, hey, um, please introduce yourself and maybe speak a little about what um, racial justice work you um, want to lift up that you do in the world. I'm going to um, pass it to Torin to start us off. Thank you. Uh, my name is Torin. I use they or she pronouns and I am a white um, I guess cisgendered woman, uh, short brown hair. Um, I'm in my dining room uh, with a white wall behind me with plants and some art candles. And I am representing an organization called the White Noise Collective. We have been around for about a decade now. We started very incidentally um, with a group of individuals who were just putting together a workshop and wanting to explore the narrative of the quote unquote white woman and the ways that that was being used to uphold white supremacy and patriarchy historically and today and that has just evolved through community input and people um, putting in the work that they want to see happen and so now we do monthly dialogues a whole range of workshops. Uh, we have a website with resources, blogs, um, and uh, an ever-widening community. And um, our focus now has expanded um, a fair amount. And we look really at this, um, the lens of what does it mean to experience the world with both a gender depression, as well as with white or light skin privilege, which I understand is uh, kind of jargony. And also we have been struggling with the best way to say it in a way that is inclusive um, and accurate. And not everyone who is involved in our work identifies with the terms of white or woman. And so we are sort of actively trying to figure out how we sort of expand into the, the crossroads that we're, we're working at. So that's... Yes, thank you for that. You know, 1,000 follow-up questions for you. <laughs> it's really amazing work. I'm not going to throw them at you, just a joke, but um, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm, my name is JD. I realized I didn't uh, do my use the access needs for people who um, might want to get a visual of who I am. So I am wearing a black shirt. I'm a white person. i uh, trans, non-binary person with short hair in front of a bookshelf with some art and plants around. And um, I'm here in Oakland, California, Ohlone territory. So uh, let's see, I, I think I'm here because I have experience as a white person in working on unlearning and uprooting and disrupting and transforming all these habit patterns of mind that have been inculcated in me since I was born to be um, with blinders on and privilege so that I will ignore what's happening to so much of the population. I was born in a small community in Massachusetts and I've lived in um, Oakland for almost 30 years now. And so I'm a core teacher at the East Bay Meditation Center in downtown Oakland, which is and called one of the most diverse meditation centers on the planet. And um, I wanna call that out because 
it's not like just like a sparkle or something that you like add to the top of your birthday cake with all sorts of exciting things. It's really this bottom line framework of radical inclusivity, looking at how things happen, what happens when we have people of color put front and center and they're at the, the structural leadership of an organization. And that's the organization that I have been intimately connected with for over 15 years. And um, it's been a lot of learning for me as a white person to um, move back and to always be like, well, maybe my knowledge and my information isn't actually called for here. And so uh, that's a really amazing experience to be in. And I've also worked for almost 25 years in the public schools in elementary and middle school and primarily uh, worked as a bilingual teacher and a ESL instructor and science teacher. So whole gamut of working with kids and families in schools here in California. Um, so I am really excited to continue this conversation and know that it's just we're just taking little bites here and this is a meal that's going to be a lifetime of working and digesting for unlearning um, white supremacy and looking at the legacies of racial injustice so thanks right hi everyone it is so great to be with you all thank you so much for coming um, my name is T. Wilhelm Tiffany, also um, uh, she or they pronouns. Um, I'm in Pittsburgh, uh, which is um, Haudenosaunee land, um, Seneca, particularly within that confederacy. Um, I am a white cis woman exploring non binariness to short, short hair, silver earrings, and a um, sort of blue pattern shirt. Um, I'm actually in my, my bedroom, so my headboard is this sort of fuzzy uh, tan carpet put on the wall and then the uh, wall behind me is uh, painted green. Um, really glad to be with you all. I, I, we had a storm earlier and a power outage, so I was, I was afraid I wouldn't get to join you all, but glad to be here. Um, so many connections um, to this work and so much passion um, for it. One of the um, uh, job I do during the day um, is with Opportunity Fund, which is a foundation here in Pittsburgh that has sort of a dual mission around funding social justice and the arts. Um, and so really thinking deeply about, about funding, about philanthropy, about where wealth um, has been extracted from and what that means um, for those systems now. Um, work in progress all the time. Um, I've also been uh, deeply honored to be connected to Art Equity. That's how I met SK and so grateful for that community. Um, Carbon Morgan, the leader of, of that space and so many humans that are connected to that. Um, I'm honored to be on the core facilitation team with that still um, and in several ways. Um, and then also, especially around this work of unlearning white supremacy, um, here in Pittsburgh, I'm so indebted to, um, so showing up for racial justice um, resource <laughs> is a national organizing space for, for white folks around racial justice. And then there are chapters and affiliates all over the country. There's an affiliate here in Pittsburgh called What's Up Pittsburgh. Um, and that when it was really, you know, eight or nine ago when I found that space. Um, and really they've, the one of the uh, activities of that group has been um, in-depth study groups around challenging white supremacy. And so I started doing those as a participant and then started facilitating and that along with so much learning from, from BIPOC folks in my life and in my community and all of the things that we read in that space, that has transformed my life for sure. And this, this unlearning um, is just a, is, is I wouldn't I'm not who I who I am now without that um, and really passionate about trying to to support other folks and finding that in whatever ways and spaces that they can um, so so glad to be here yes oh wow just like really inspiring um, folks in this conversation um, you know uh, something that we're sort of wanting to throw out there is maybe also just talking about what white supremacy is. I sort of uh, gave a, a little bit of a definition earlier that just was like my words. And I'm wondering, Tiffany, you want to talk about that a little bit? How are you feeling? Sure. Yeah. And I loved just, just your framing from your heart. I think that's, that's where, where it's key. Um, I was just uh, today like going back to some like core things that have been so inspirational. So one of the first things we read 
in that study is, um, is a piece by Elizabeth um, Martinez, who just wrote this piece called What is White Supremacy? And there's a definition at the top, and then the whole piece, which we'll be sure to send you all, um, just unpacks every bit of that. Um, but that definition is um, white supremacy is a historically based, institutionally perpetuated system of exploitation and oppression of continents, nations, and peoples of color by white peoples and nations of European continent for the purpose of maintaining and defending a system of wealth, power, and privilege. Like, to me, that gets it all um, in one space. Um, and so our work of, of understanding then how, how that lives and is in the air in every institution in our theaters in our every single organization that we're a part of in ourselves um, how that plays out and how that system has managed to live for this many centuries i mean it is just it just you know it sort of it blows my mind um, so so one of the things i'm sure we'll talk about a little sk I already lifted up a couple of the there's just there's a really great play, uh, piece by tema oaken um also crediting um kenneth jones in that piece um called white supremacy culture and and we already lifted up the sort of perfectionism and sense of urgency and i bet we'll touch on other pieces of those things but going through that resource like you can just spend time with it every day i could spend time with it every day of my life i like need to see or keep going back to it and just journal coming up in me every single day um, what am i seeing showing up around me how can we name those things when they happen um, in order to to see it more clearly it's hard to see culture like one of the the things about that because it's so um it's so just all around us all the time um so part of it is just trying to to see those things. So I'm sure we'll dig into that more, but we'll, and we'll definitely share that resource. So. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, can folks hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah. You know, I feel like uh, I have this desire, you know, there's like, we read these definitions, there's so much information out there, you know, that is available and that we're sharing. And I encourage folks to like, just dive into it if you haven't already after this phone call or this zoom call but i also you know i really want to hear from people's lift experiences too and that's like why i invited you all into the call um i sort of have this structure of like listen let's talk about external work um i welcome any sort of <laughs> challenges to that structure or even just you know sort of breaking it open um it will be better for it so um i'd love to just ask out to the panel you know what what does the internal work of unlearning white supremacy of racial justice look like for you and i'll just throw it out to anyone who who's who's feeling like they, they would like to answer that question I can get us started. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Um, so, you know, for me, I think there's so many parts to what I think of internally. And I will just say, you know, I, I like this idea of complicating the internal and external. And I draw a lot of framework from um, Barbara Love and, and John. And they specifically talk about this uh, format of like a liberal Tory consciousness and the four parts that they always name are self-awareness analysis accountability and action and that it's like this constant cycle between these four items always informing each other um, and so for me that um that work of always doing the the analysis of just trying to always learn more um, and go out into the world and do it and learn more um, and this idea of praxis, um, you know, ideas and action is so important. Uh, I think relationships um, is a big part of it's, you know, where in it most, you know, internal and external. And I, I think that, you know, being in deep and accountable relationships with others who are committed to, you know, the same values, goals is really a part of what sustains me in the work. Um, and especially having relationships with folks who are most impacted 
um, another organization that I'm a part of is called Black and Pink, and we do a lot of work in solidarity with incarcerated LGBTQ individuals. And there were definitely times when I was feeling just overwhelmed and I just didn't know that I could keep doing the work. And it was one of my comrades in prison who helped kind of remind me uh, like why the work mattered um, and how I could sort of strategize to do that work differently. Um, and I think those relationships also helped me remember my privilege. And, you know, in this world, I know that I can wake up every day and kind of ignore the problems. Uh, but being in deep relationship um, with people of color, I think, centers me in waking up every day knowing that I'm still living in a world that is not safe for people um, and for people that I love. And I want to live in a world where, where everyone I love can drive down the street and know they're safe. Um, and, and that pushes me to take risks and, and really go outside of my comfort zone. Um, and I think helps, you know, stay centered in love. I mean, we make a lot of mistakes and it, it can feel overwhelming. So, um, you know, I think the, I think that helps. And, um, you know, remembering that hope, hope is a, it's a tool. It's a hope is a weapon, right? And so the state, you know, I feel like there's a lot of forces that make this work feel impossible. <laughs> and, and so making the choice to continue to feel like some other world is possible is like one of the biggest sort of things that I can do. Um, yeah. Um, deep snaps to that. Thank you so much. I wonder if the other panelists have a response. Um, I'm down to also jump in too, but want to give y'all. JD, do you want to go? I, I took a little space here at the beginning, so I offer to you. Look at a sharing space. Okay. Um, yeah, I, so much of what you said, Torin, res resonated with me, you know, like the sense of like the internal and the external are, you know, there really is no separation. It's just an artifact to allow ourselves to work in different levels and different places and different frameworks. And for me as a meditation teacher, there's definitely a lot of internal that I do about developing capacity, developing stamina. And so just to speak to that for a moment, but doing it in the context. So knowing that I'm doing it in the context, I'm not doing it for an individual liberation. Uh, you know, it just isn't just to make myself feel better and make myself having more ease. But I'm doing this internal work because I believe that I want a world where all beings can live with enough food, with safety to walk the streets, with good education that I can engage. And I know that that's not where I live right now. And so the one one of the values and one of the practices that I want to be just so um, supportive in terms of like this way of a sustainability and being able to um, to really bear to bear these the legacies of violence and the we see to this day um, is compassion and compassion really gets a bad rap compassion just is like this fluffy like hallmark kind of thing but it's deep, deep practice. And it is through compassion that I can turn towards the suffering in my life and turn towards the suffering that I see. I've talked to so many people and myself included who, um, you know, like, I just, I can't watch that. I just can't watch that. And like, as somebody mentioned earlier, I think it was SK, the sense of, or just the sense of that I can turn it off because I have this white skin privilege, I can turn it off. But for me to develop the capacity to turn towards the suffering, if I practice with compassion, like really embodying this felt sense of what it means to live in a community that allows racial hatred, what does it mean to live in a community where the norm is inequity? I don't want to, I don't want to believe that. I don't, I want to just pretend I want to pretend that everything's nice, that we're all kind people. And in order to get below that, that pole, I need to really go into this depth of what it means to be fully human, that we have this capacity and we can see it. And in our structures, in our systemic racism in this country, built in. And so how do I turn towards that history where people with the skin color of mine 
have turned dogs on people, have prevented all these things. How do, how do I hold that and not go into overwhelm? And to me, it's a deep, deep, long-term commitment to believing it's possible. So that's the hope. Believing there's a way other than let me just get all the things I can. Well, if you got a little bit of the crumbs, you're okay. So how do I do that? And I was just listening to, um, many of you probably listened to On Being with Krista Tippett. And I was just listening to a talk with um, Victor Harding and Krista Tippett. And he was quoting, um, Victor Harding was quoting Martin Luther King. And he was talking about the three C's that Martin Luther King said, compassion, courage, and creativity. I really loved that compassion, courage, and creativity because like we need the compassion to actually feel into what's happening. And then we need the courage to turn towards it and be like, all right, I'm here. We're in this, let's do it. And then the creativity, which is part of what we're doing here in the arts and the theater to like create a world that's possible, this transformation of what we think is the way things are. Because the way things are is in this process of change. And so I really believe that we can influence that if we stay embodied in who we are. So, um, yeah. So I don't know. That's a little bit, but it's deep, deep practice. So thanks. T, do you want to add some in? Sure. That's beautiful. Thank you both. I I was just so excited to be in this conversation and learn from folks. And um, yeah, there's there's many folks in my life that are that are good meditators. Good, not. <laughs> that have a real beautiful practice of that. And I know that that's such a space that I want to grow into more. It's a place where I've struggled for sure. And I know that that is a real um, resilience tool um, that I need. Um, but when I think of sort of the internal work that I, that I have been engaged in, um, one of the things I was noticing is like in this last, like, you know, six weeks or so, since things have been so heightened um, since the murder of George Floyd, that I I let go of some of my personal work in those times. Like I get so so action oriented, which is important, but yet it's got to, it's kind of got to be all be happening at the same time, right? And so um, so I want to be sure I return to that. And so it goes for me. It does go so much beyond. Like I I certainly started out in this space so much about the learning and realizing all of these things things that I, that I needed to know. Um, so it started there, but then you, you realize how much whiteness is, a, is one of the kind of culture pieces of that is intellectualizing and, and all of this head work when we're not learning to be embodied, learning to be connected to an entire, entire self, spirit, so much disconnection. Um, so, so that's a pace where I just know I still have so much further to go all of the time. Um, I, you know, therapy, I think, is part of that work. I started doing some of that a year or so ago. I've paused a little bit and I'm asking myself why I've paused. Um, that's really important. And it sort of goes to to like really deep look at, at me and family patterns and family history, um, which I know a lot of folks connect to in anti-racism work like how do we how do we know what we're connected to in terms of our ancestry um and with you know with we're so, so many of us that so um in my case in particular i'm adopted so that's sort of another disconnection point um and grew up in a white family uh, but then have met my birth mother at which which is great glad i'm so glad she's in my life um and then knew that she had done some of her kind of ancestry work over time and you know after many years of asking i finally got some of that and found that some of her ancestry actually goes back to the mayflower to like original colonizers and the way of like just learning that like a year and a half two years ago was just so grounded me in this work in a different kind of way so um so then it too just is like so much thinking about the family I grew up in too and like our patterns that we have and the way we communicate and the way that more and more I can see how white supremacy just gets transferred from generation to generation and how then it's so you know put into me and that it's so hard to try to to try to share that conversation with my family is, a, is certainly an ongoing challenge uh, but for some folks I can I can have great conversations with my aunt around that and I'm so valuing that um, so it has so many aspects you know I'm with with 
different groups of folks. There's a small group of us that's working through um, Me and White Supremacy by Leo Saad, um, another beautiful tool to help do that sort of self-investigation work. Um, but like you said, Torin, that sort of self-awareness piece is so key to build like with the analysis, with the action, with everything else. So I'll pause there for a moment too. There's, there's always more. <laughs> Yes, thank you for that. Sorry, I was just reading one of the questions in the Q and A. Um, yeah, I feel like oh god, listening to you all talk, I'm like, yes, it's also connected. The internal external, it's like you know whatever. But you know, it just made me think of work. I see so many people, you know, white people in particular, shutting down, hiding, you know, having um, some you know, I, I talk about white fragility a lot, which are sort of like these emotional reactions to racial stress that sort of Robin D'Angelo has identified that um, dictate so much of how white people respond to things and are able to show up in the world. So I think for me, a lot of the personal work is like getting really familiar with those responses so that we can move through them. I think a lot of tokenism, quick fixes, like a quick, you know, donation, while those are like, you know, I'm like all about sharing money, like, you know, I'm not going to tell anyone not, but I think sometimes we do that to buy ourselves more time to not feel, you know, <laughs> like, okay, cool, we'll just do this thing. And then we can keep going how we've been going. I think I see that in a lot of theaters who are like, oh, we'll just hire more people of color right now. That'll make things better, right? Without doing the real work to like really interrogate, like what has the culture been up to now? And we still need to be around, you know? I think that kind of like taking action from, um, instead of from the sort of like pushing away avoidance space and instead taking action like through the hard feelings and out of like deep relationship and connection, is investing in hope for liberation as opposed to further investing in our disconnection is what I'll add to. Um, yeah, I would love to break, before we sort of transition to folks, I would love to hear about some of the external work, the organizing work. I'm gonna bring it to you, Torin, a little bit. We already have a question in the Q&A <laughs> about white women and sort of, um, you know, this idea of like, how does a black woman confront a queer Karen? And um, yeah, maybe we'll, maybe I would love for you to talk about white noise and then this will be the first question maybe we take and invite um, to speak in the, the space, but would love to hear, especially, you know, there's a lot of theater people on this call and nonprofits in general are very quickly being dominated by white cis women as well. So like, I would love to just hear you speak about yeah, how the work you do at White Noise and how white womanhood, quote unquote, is used to uphold racism and white supremacy. I know that's no small ask, but anything you can add, Doran. Sure. Um, I mean, I will just say that I think that, um, you know, I just want to echo what JD said around compassion. Um, you know, I've been, I've been learning this for 15 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I came into the work uh, as a very poor white person and, and it took me a long time to understand how this concept of white privilege died to me because I did not feel privileged, right? And I think that we, you know, we do need to learn how to understand how complex the relationships are between racism and classism and this whole system of capitalism and, um, and colonization, these sort of big things impact people really differently. And when someone is feeling marginalized, it is hard to understand <laughs> how you are also being privileged in a system. And, um, and so I think for me, coming from that helps me have a lot more presence in what can be really frustrating conversations um, with others. <laughs> and so I always sort of, you know, I think about um, why it was so hard for me to understand. And I think that helps ground. Um, and I would say, uh, I guess, diving into this question about the ways that white womanhood is, is weaponized. I mean, we can see a lot of, um, 
there's a lot of different ways to answer that. And, and I think it is really complicated because, I mean, you can draw it back all the way to, um, you know, the witch hunts in Europe, right? Um, and, and before that and in every continent and land. Um, but in sort of the development of this capitalist system that we have, there was a lot of oppression of, um, of, of women. And I'll use that term, even though I want to think about a lot of us in a more gender expansive way, but um, so just as a shorthand for language, right? The only way is sometimes that, that women could get out of the home was in charity work, right? Was through the church, was through like certain pathways. And we can look at the development of things like the welfare state and how, how um, you know, in order to get, you know, so let me take even a step back, right? Because before the sort of capitalist system came about, um, a lot of things were held in common, the land, like people could provide for themselves. And it was really in the development of capitalism that a lot of gender depression got developed, right? And, and um, systematized um, uh, a real control of, of womanhood, right? In, in service of of, um, of patriarchy. And, and so I think that there has been ire, right, to get out into the world and, and recognizing that often the only path to do that were professions, but most of those were in the service of, of a white supremacist system. Um, and so like I mentioned the development of the welfare state. So in the, you know, it was within a hundred years of, of all the commons starting to get privatized. Um, when, 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 when houselessness and poverty sort of started, right? Um, and, and in order to receive welfare, you know, you had to parade around town. Um, and yeah, so there's just all these, there's, there's this like deep, deep, deep history of ways um, that these systems have kind of been developed and shaped into our bodies and our narratives of what's possible. Um, and we can look at the sort of the dawn of this country and how much of it is based on something we call a, a virtuous victim narrative. And we see that over and over in a way that, you know, um, women, white women in particular, were often seen as the property of white men. Um, and their virtue was often used as an excuse for violence against men of color. Um, and so there's just a lot, of, I mean, that, I mean, we can, we can draw a lot of examples. I mean, it comes back to captiv captivity narratives, right? And looking at the ways that um, Native populations were um, characterized through their relationship to the narrative of a white woman and all the way through, um, you know, to today. So, so I think that it's important to start to learn the ways that those things happen. Um, yeah, I guess that's a little bit of what I would say in response to that question. Totally, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and just also building on like sort of the foundation of our modern day police system, you know, is like what I learned a lot from a white noise collective <laughs> workshop was a lot uh, you know, based on the slave patrols, you know, which I think were justified by this sort of protecting white women, you know, from like slaves who, you know, this idea that they raped or whatever, right? Like so early that idea had a whole systemic, systemic structure that is policing and harming, you know, color and black people today, like, um, yeah, and I learned that from y'all, you know, <laughs> like that was something I didn't know before. Um, and I, I think there's space within that actually sort of um, white people who experience gender oppression to, to actually break through like being used in that way, you know, actually to take some agency back from that narrative. Um, yeah, I, we are at 5.55. I want to open it up to questions and I also really want to invite T and JD and Torin to um, talk more about your work in the world um, as it as it's relevant to the questions too because I want to make sure that we don't um, lose that portion of it too and honor our um, our commitment to 
these these people here and complete the circle. So let's um, our first question. Well, we had Patricia. So Patricia Nunley was the first question. And um, Patricia, I'd like to invite you to speak that question out loud if you'd like to. If not, just let us know in the chat and I can read it for you. I can give you a second here. We got Patricia Nunley. Oh, great. We'll unmute, we'll unmute you. Um, welcome to the conversation. I think you're stu still muted. Oh, Patricia, hello. Okay. Hi, how are you? Hi, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you all, thank you all. So um, let, me, let me ask the question quickly. So, so when I say Karen, everybody understands what I mean, right? The, the white women that call the, the police African-American. So for people who can't figure that out. So I am used to queer people. That's my, them, that's my family. That's my tribe also. Okay? So I'm considered cisgendered, et cetera, et cetera, right? But queer people for me have always been cool people. So recently I um, had this situation with what I would call a queer Karen, and they don't even go together to me. But maybe that's me not understanding the complex because someone in the beginning said something about um, even when you say you're identifying as a woman, it doesn't necessarily fit. So I think you guys get my, so I need help. Give me some strategies because there's something called a queer Karen and that makes no sense to me. Now I'll, I'll be quiet. Thank you so much for that question, Patricia. Really appreciate it. Strategies for um, engaging with a queer Karen. Does anyone have um, some thoughts right off the top? All right, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna answer the question. I'm gonna share a few thoughts. It's you know, anytime there's a particular individual and you ask a question about a particular individual, I may be way off the mark because I don't know that person. But what I think about when I think dynamics of, 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 of white women who are fearful, white women who are fearful, so they're leading with fear. And so they're coming from a place of protection. And what is there to be protected? There's wealth to be protected, which has been inherited through an unjust system. There's a body to be protected that we've been taught is going to be harmed by particular bodies. And in our culture, if we look at who is racialized to be the perpetrator, we're taught through our education, we're taught through our movies, we're taught through social media, that it's black and brown people of color, indigenous people who are attacking. And so then in we have this huge thing about ignorance. And instead of meeting us each other on a heart to heart basis, meeting each other as humanity, we meet each other as commodities. It's like I need to protect this body from other bodies and we create walls, big walls, small walls, armors. And so that's my beginning of the conversation is that is somebody acting from fear and protecting and, and which is, or is it person actually reaching into a humanity place? And for me, I've actually had to unlearn, like unlearn, like, oh, there's fear rising because, you know, I have this image and this habit tendency to see particular kind of people as being, you know, somehow so it's it's a lot of practice and so i hope that helped that's supportive but maybe somebody else can add in or there's another question uh, I go for it, I, was, I, was, I don't think i much i'd add just to say that just every identity has every different mindset and and growth space within it so yeah it's a challenging thing for sure yeah White, white queer people don't escape white supremacy and racism too, you know? I really relate to what Torin was saying also about having an experience of oppression and also having the experience of privilege. Yeah, I've um, ex yeah, experienced that personally as a growth edge and also witnessed it in, in other folks as well. Um, you know, I want to be like, where are the other queer white people, you know, <laughs> doing the work with the, with the queer Karen? Um, 
Oh, shoot. And I had another thing. I forgot. But Soren, did you want to say one more thing? I noticed you unmuted. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just, um, you know, one of the things we do in White Noise is uh, workshops around difficult conversations. And, and that's certainly what you're in. And it's like, how do we come to someone to try to support them in, in, in recognizing something in self that they aren't seeing? And, and I think it's important that we all understand, like SK and others are surfacing, that just because you're marginalized in one way does not mean you are not privileged and oppressive in another. And I think all queer people and everyone needs to understand that. Um, you know, you're marginal. It's easy to, I, I, um, I'm forgetting the, the film that was in, but there was a, a quote, which is about how it's easy to see the doors, right, that you, that you hit, and it's hard to see the ones that are open to you. And so I think we often center the parts of ourselves especially in activist communities, um, you know, the parts of ourselves that are marginalized and it's harder to breathe into and really embody the parts that are privileged. And, and so I think it's, you know, when you're having this station with someone, it's really how do you stay centered in yourself and just invite them into um, a conversation to, to see a thing that they might not see in themselves. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And then I can also, um, maybe share like a handout of, of practices that we offer in our workshops uh, with the follow-up resources. Yeah, it's like so much a part of the unlearning. It makes me think I was in a circle once with someone, it was a white um, cis woman who was like, well, if I see someone across the street or if I see a black man coming on, uh, like walking towards me on the sidewalk, I'm gonna cross the street because of safety. And, you know, then there's this counteractive question. It's like, oh, well, would you cross the street if it was a white man, you know, and like being able to sort of break through like those really subtle differences, right? Would you cross the street if you were really close with black men in your life, right? Like, what are the ways we actually can like, um, cut through the stuff, the narratives that we've internalized that maybe are not based on reality, um, and yeah, anyways. Okay, thank you for that question. So much to say. Uh, let's move it on to, okay. All right, Liz Drummond, totally respect you not wanting to speak. Uh, I am a white, this is quote, I am a white woman. Can Torin talk a bit more about how she came to recognize this dynamic? Is there a precipitating event or a gradual realization or an educational? context um i wonder if that's the dynamic of hmm. sk I... oh yeah it's eric i texted you uh, i think liz is referring to a comment earlier in the chat that i texted you oh I... T is talk well T was talking about white supremacy embedded in family patterns. Torin is talking about sort of white women. Liz Drummond submitted a question. She, okay, you know what? We're just gonna pause for clarification. Liz, so sorry. We're gonna move to the next question. And if my back end team could um, figure it out with Liz in the meantime, if it's about white womanhood or about T's um, sort of family legacy, I would so appreciate. Liz, we will come back to you. Um, all right, and we got, oops. okay, so we're going to Michelle Mansfield. Oh, I prefer not to read my question. Y'all, I really respect your preference and also encouraging folks to come, to come in voice to voice. Um, you know, we're asking folks to be brave, just a reminder. Okay, Michelle Mansfield. <clears throat> I am a white woman living in the Midwest, not normally an angry person. I'm from Chicago. Hello. Um, and I feel so much of it these days related to how I see people in our country responding to the outcry against white supremacy for the umpteenth time it seems like. I am white and my anger I know cannot even come close to what people of color feel every day. How do you challenge or channel this anger for pot positive change? By the way, I do have hope that change is possible and conversations like this are helping. How do you channel anger towards positive change? A great question. Um, can I, I, 
can I, I'm going to take this one just really quick, just to kick us off. Uh, it's the inverse. I will say, um, I feel like I really started to like, for real, for real, getting politicized around whiteness, maybe five or six years ago. And I felt so much rage. And I especially felt rage. You know, I felt like I was seeing the matrix for the first time, right? You just, it was like, when I first made, took my first women's studies course, and then I just like was full of rage, you know, it's like someone gives you this information and you're like, what the F, you know, I've been like duped. And, um, and I, at the time directed a lot of rage at my family, right? And my close relationships, because I suddenly had this knowledge. And then I'd be in relationship and conversation with people and be able to to spot it all of a sudden I had this new vision and I got so angry <laughs> and it came out in judgment and it came out um, as anger directed towards other white people which I think sometimes is justified but for me my experience in those close relationships it did a lot of damage it did a lot of damage and I had to spend like many years sort of repairing that and rebuilding trust with folks, especially in my family, so they felt comfortable sharing their vulnerable feelings about race, um, which I found in this moment, there's actually been a turnaround, but I've really learned from, I think that was a misdirection of my anger or a mishandling of it um, in trying to have conversations with the folks around me. SK earlier, I think you, when in the opening you were sort of talking about just actually connecting to emotion is such a part of this. And I know for me for so long, I just felt disconnected from my own emotion. I still feel that absolutely. And, and somehow, and, and getting, getting tuned into that, getting, um, getting clear that like sometimes like today I was really angry, <laughs> like one person over, for one small thing and it actually is really coming from the just overall area of, of all of the things that's happening right now and so how how to sort of see that whole thing happening within in me and then you know find it figure out what is the 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 most productive way to relate to the person where, where it, to me it feels like i'm angry at this person um yeah and and overall it is just just the 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 big rage sometimes I still feel numb to, and that I know is a piece I still need to work on. That's where sort of the more embodiment has to come for me. And I feel it at the same time and it's driving me every day. So it's, it's, it's so many both ands in all of that, for sure. Oh, I really appreciate what both of you just said. And I just wanted to add on this way of that, um, the sense of emotions kind of coupled with the niceness that so many of our communities and uh, white communities have been trained in is that naming problems, naming tension is like, ooh, ooh, let's just all step around it and pretend it's not here. And so I really, one of the things that has been helpful for me with my anger is realizing that underneath that anger is this connection, it's this passion towards like, to actually seeing and connecting with the unjust injustice that's happening. And so the anger is a symptom of this connection that I'm having to another human that I've been trained through politeness to be like, oh, well, let's just like shuffle the, dare, the you know, the deck chairs around and everything's going to be fine, but it's not fine. And so the rage to me is a really beautiful awakening to like, it is not fine. I need to feel it is well, we won't say that. Um, it is not fine, <laughs> you know, and the, rather than being polite. And so the other part of that is it's much easier to be like, it's your fault. You are the problem. And so we take my rage and I'm going to put it all on a person where it's just like hundreds and hundreds of years and systems and all things built up. And then here I am angry. And if I can just forgive, because like I can know sometimes my rage could be at the dish sink, you know, <laughs> it's just actually not about the dish sink at all. It's about the homeless people outside. It's about the racial injustice with healthcare. It's about, you know, somebody, a uh, black man being killed. You know, all of this rage is over a bypass of, uh, not, it's not a bypass. It's a real beautiful indication 
of the injustice of a system. So that's one of the ways that I've seen it. And it means that I need to get in touch with it, which isn't always, as you were saying, T is not always comfortable. So thank you. Cool. Um, I'm going to move us on to the next question, unless Torin, Torin, you've got something. Cool. All right, let's return to Liz Drummond, who has, and then we'll go Bennett Anderson. So if you could get ready for another live question, which I love. Um, so Liz says, sorry, I meant, quote, the narrative of the white woman and how that is used to white supremacy, which resonates with me. I'd just love to know a little more about her story. I have teen daughters and want to guide and to learn more myself. Great question. Um, and so the question is just how I under I learned to understand that, or could you help me? You know, <laughs> can you talk? Yeah, I guess how how you came to recognize this dynamic, or maybe talk a little more about that dynamic about how white women is used to uphold racism and white supremacy or white womanhood. Yeah, I mean, we can, I can, I can um, definitely point folks in the direction of a, a lot of resources. I think this is a, a great area to, to learn about. Um, but I mean, it shows up in just every part of our media and our, our, you know, we see it in the movies, we see it everywhere. Um, I mean, if you think about even like the Godzilla, right, image, um, right? I mean, if you break that down, um, right, there's an image of a black man and a white woman. Um, you think about anti-miscegenation laws and how all of that was sort of uh, being developed in this country and, and, and the way that, that the white woman was weaponized as a tool of white supremacy so that it's never actually been about protecting white women. We know that statistically, white women are far more likely to experience violence in an intimate partner situation in their their own homes and most often from white men like that's just that's the reality um, but society is like there's this portrait that we are given that we're fed from birth right it's the air that we're breathing um, that says that we are victims and that we need to be protected and who's going to protect us it's going to be white men and the state and the police and the prisons um, and, and, and at no point do we have agency or autonomy in that, right? Um, again, because we are actually just a, a tool in this system. Um, and, and that's not to say that, that, that many white women and, um, you know, white folks uh, who are not cis men, right, across the gender spectrum um, haven't actively participated in that. And that's one of the things you referenced in the workshop we did where we really broke down historic examples um, and a lot of those are on our website, um, but, you know, where people actively um, use that fear of the other to sort of lift up themselves, um, you know, with or without actress choice, um, you know, and I think we, we saw that in, um, in the, the Amy Cooper example, right? I mean, that's the more, one of the more recent ones. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that answers the question. Um, for me, how I came to you know, realize it is, <laughs> it would probably take me longer than the rest of the time um, to speak to my own <laughs> journey, but uh, it's, um, yeah, it's just been a lot of learning. And I think for me, it, it started with just a, a moment of waking up to the injustice and just getting that glimmer. And I think as soon as you wake up to it, you can't go to sleep, right? So, um, you know, it's just been a diving in since then. Yeah, I'll also say a, a lot of like people who are assigned female at birth are conditioned to be in caretaking roles and to keep things like status quo and to not disrupt. And for a lot of people like, you know, in our bones and like a lot of people I think in organizations too, like replicate that behavior. And I think a lot of um, white women are really uniquely positioned to like be hella radical and break through and use, use that actually narrative of, you know, um, white men being supposed to be being protected by white men to like interrupt that, you know, and use that um, position to like, um, push back into sort of breakthrough 
Yeah, and I'll just add one thing, which is the thread I forgot, which is also about white feminism. And I think that's always important to name, which is, you know, when we are fighting against patriarchy, like, are, are we acknowledging our white privilege? Um, because so often the histories of feminism, and we, we call them white feminism now, to really name that by and large they were um, not centering and acknowledging uh, women of color and sort of you know, this idea of intersectionality. Um, and, and so it's important to also recognize that in our attempt to liberate one part of our identity, we can actually sort of side with the oppressor and, um, and actually cause like more harm. And so that's just another piece, I think, of that pattern of, of white womanhood and um, that's helpful to name and learn about. Cool, thank you for that. Um, application of white women's tears but that would also take a whole nother <laughs> I mean do you wanna <laughs> you're, you're welcome you're welcome to go for it uh, you know I think it's just part of it's part of that victimhood thing for sure um, and the wage it just even now that white women's tears are weaponized I, I know I can think for myself early in my sort of wake waking up time uh, um, time where I was really being challenged by a black woman and there was a time when we were you know really wrestling together and I cried and there were other people witnessing and how damaging that was to that person I was with and I, I just I hold the grief of that um, of not knowing and then there are times too when I our, our tears or lack of them are like a numbness or a not feeling that is also just as damaging when, when there is grief that we should behold collectively. So it's just, there's so much depth and complication in all of that, um, but especially knowing how white women's tears have been weaponized in the ways that Torin was talking about is, is key. <laughs> well, and just to jump in, you know, the fact in that scenario, like just breaking it down a little bit, right? The fact that you got emotional, the fact cried is not a problem, right? It's the fact that what happens next is that becomes the center of attention, right? Suddenly the dynamic is about taking care of the white woman who's crying, right? Which completely leaves whoever else is in dialogue decentered, right? It happens all the time, right? The white people's emotions get centered so I just I just want to make that distinction real quick absolutely and that goes to you know I think we were not naming but white fragility like that whole concept in that way I, JD was talking earlier about a lot of the strategies and resilience we can build to to not have that emotional reaction that decenters where the actual harm is and that's absolutely what we need to keep keep working on all the time Oh my God. And uh, Bennett, we're going to invite you into the conversation to speak. And I just want to tag on a call in for white systems to express emotion, right? Sometimes in contrast to like, you know, white femininity, having a lot of emotion are all these, you know, you know, and shutting down and like, you know, we actually really need a lot of white cis straight men to be doing this work right now. This is a direct ask from SK, who's exhausted. <laughs> JK, JK. Okay, Bennett, go for it. We, we love your question. Hello. Um, I just want to say I am a white cis queer man. <clears throat> Excuse me. Give me a little context. Uh, so my question is what's a, a concrete action you would recommend to someone early in their journey towards dismantling internalized white supremacy? Some action or resource or something that has really helped you in your journey and uh, like, for example something that really helped me that I learned you know several years ago was um, civility and tone policing as a way to shut down a conversation and really that has very much helped me to take a step back and focus on what is actually the most important thing in a conversation rather than you know getting upset that somebody's not doing not carrying the conversation in a way that i would have wanted you know a couple of years ago but getting comfortable with that uh, uncomfortableness um i just want to piggyback on what t was talking about earlier about the white supremacy characteristics and so really becoming familiar with the characteristics, for example, like efficiency, 
Efficiency is not a characteristic that's bad in and of itself, but if it becomes the characteristic that runs a meeting, like we have to make a decision now, then whose voices are included, whose voices are excluded and other things around perfectionism. So all of those characteristics that sort of come together, that streamline power in a situation. And so whoever has the most power will speak forward and that will be the question that's heard and that will be the answer that's formed, that forms the next policy and things like that. And so I think that um, I really want to speak to those characteristics. And, and as he was mentioning, like, if I could just begin to see like you're in a meeting and you're like oh my gosh we really need to have this done and like I had an image once that really helped form this for me is like in indigenous societies you know there's a question and it's like let's all go sit by the river let's go by a tree let's ask questions of bringing in all you know perspectives and let's go around the circle but that's not generally the way it happens in our groups and so i'm not saying that we have to take three years or seven years or five generations to make a decision but what i am saying is to notice in ourselves those patterns when does urgency arise when does individualism arise when does all these different characteristics and that's the um the the source that was put right at the beginning of the chat so i find like looking at those internally have just been invaluable to see it internally and externally when's it running a meeting when's it running my friends when's how all those are arising great um joe barry go for it we're ready for you yeah thank you um can you hear me yes please go ahead yeah, uh, well, it seems from my own, my own experience that most white people who are working class in the United States and therefore exploited as workers main, mainly will make progress against their own racism in the context of needing to strengthen a common struggle. Not merely, you know, in other words, like a union fight against boss. In other words, there is a material interest in fighting racism and confronting their own racism and confronting other people's racism and behaving in a different way than they perhaps did in the past or their parents did, uh, and not just a moral appeal. And that, uh, so I would love to have all of you react to that. that that's my experience as an old guy who spent a lot of years organizing people uh, and trying to organize white folks to be willing to overcome their own racism enough to engage in, in union fights and other kinds of fights uh, uh, with people of color. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, we, I just wanna also say we're running close to time. We might be pushing it a couple minutes so i want to just check in with my panelists if that's okay if anyone has a hard stop okay we're going to push it a few minutes over just so we can get these questions in just a couple of them um would anyone like to although jd i don't know if i heard of i saw a visual cue for you if okay yeah okay great um <clears throat> yes too short i know oh, i know um who does anyone like would anyone like to answer um joe I mean, I'll just, I'll just say that, yeah, I mean, in many ways, I agree. Um, I'm a, my, my, uh, much of my work is as a union organizer. And so I work specifically with, uh, you know, with um, people who are trying to improve like their wages, their benefits, their working conditions. I work in healthcare specifically, um, but I think it is important. I think that part of the fight against racism is helping people understand, especially the working class and the poor, what their stake is and that what we're in is a class war and racism is a big tool, right? White supremacy is a tool. Um, but at the end of the day, it really is about a wealthy owning ruling class trying to maintain power whatever ways they can. And racism is one way that they have divided us. Um, but there's a lot of people, especially out of, out of the South, um, I know of one um, professor in, at UT Austin right, who, who writes specifically about uh, how a class analysis can help bring people into conversations about race 
Um, and so I think it is important that we, that we center that and that sometimes that is a way in to the conversation for some people. Um, yeah, and how to help people understand what their stake is in it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I support that, sir. I think that's really beautiful. Um, yeah, caution us from talking. I know we're doing it a lot, but it's generally for us to not be talking about like huge swaths of people, you know, and just to like clarify that I think, you know, um, I can do better at that too. You know, when I'm talking about all white people, like all white people are hella different and have really different experiences too, you know? And like, so a lot of times I'm speaking from my experience and my experience like working in theaters, my experience in queer and trans community, my experience living in Oakland, like um, just sort of naming some of the over intellectualizing and speaking on behalf of large groups of people that can happen in these conversations. Um, but thank you for that. Maybe let's hit one more. Um, Beverly, I see the question and um, I'm going to skip it because I, we have offered a lot of resources in the chat and as we follow up, um, I'd recommend reading them and the hashtag we see you demands from black and indigenous and people of color, like theater professionals in this, in our field, they, they have the demands. So in terms of how do we support art organizations, we gotta look there because that's, that's where everyone should be following is the work of black and um, indigenous and people of color leaders in this field. Um, okay. Oh gosh, there's a lot of really good questions. I guess, Josh, let's see, we have defense of this. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm not gonna read this question. I'm just, just gonna go for it because a bunch of people have like voted for it and this will be our last question. Addie, I um, see you and just wanna let you know that I'm down to have this conversation outside of this space too because I think your um, question is really important. And Sean Liverman will get to you. Um, we'll find a way to connect with you so your question doesn't go unanswered. Um, Joshua Waterstone, do you want to come on and ask the question? Sure, yeah. Um, and thank you so much for, uh, for all the panelists for being here and for holding this discussion. I'm just, uh, basically, uh, what are strategies in naming defensiveness when you see it without creating more defensiveness? I mean, that's, that's the gist of my question. Um, I know it takes a lot of self work. Uh, I feel like I'm really trying to do that work in myself and kind of say what I want to find what is right without being right, right? Um, and so to do that, I have to be like, well, it doesn't matter about my ego or what I said before, it's about what is right. Let's find what's right, let's not just be right. But when you're in an organization and you're uh, with others, um, defensiveness comes up, especially with you know, um, things such as being called out for uh, racist acts. And I guess how to disarm that um, uh, in a group. Uh, best practices maybe you're using in your own organization or best practices that you, you could offer. Thank you. I'll just offer like a small thing that I've offered some folks and it's been helpful is that sometimes when that is happening, I just sort of ask us to pause and try to zoom out, try to zoom out to the bigger picture of, of you know, what might be happening in our organization, what injustices are happening in the moment in the world, what injustices have been happening historically, and can we, can we have some focus there that that's, that's where, that's what we're trying to address. And the way that our small little interactions add up to all of that are important, and so that's why we want to tackle that but it just it's sort of always for me at least like I try to do that for myself personally when I feel myself getting defensive it's like oh wait what is the much bigger picture here than just like how I'm feeling in this moment helps for won't for others but I offer um I'll just add I think coming from a, a stance of curiosity can be helpful like trying to understand why they believe what they do um, making it clear that you're not questioning their inherent worth as a human, which, you know, it's, it's sad to say, but I think for so many of us, um, you know, part of fragility that, 
Um, we don't know how to have these conversations. We don't know how to be wrong. We don't know how to change our minds about things. Like, and so um, I think if you can make that the premise and that this is about the society that we're trained into and I care and love about you, you know, care, care about you and love you and, and will, and that this is a thing that isn't sitting right with me, right? And so you bring it back to just the impact on you from a centered place, um, I think can, would be one tip. Um, I just wanted to add in, it's like, what's the general operating atmosphere that's going on? Like, if it's work or in your family, is it okay to bring up problems or are problems put aside? So, you know, like one of the things that we put in place at the East Bay Meditation Center is this principles for handling tension. Because even at a place that was really diverse, we said we were trying to, we were too avoidant. And so we have this principles for handling tension. And so if there's tension, we actually are encouraged to name it before it erupts. So there's tension here. And then when we look at, we get curious as Torin said, Ed, and then we listen and then also look at the structural components that are contributing to that tension. So it's not just a personality thing. And in all that personality thing, I just want to name the good white self because the good white self is like that person who's just started learning these things. And let me tell you, I know all, all the answers because I just read these three books. And so I support that good white person because they want liberation. They want to have freedom for all but a little bit you know internalize it let the people of color speak their own things don't speak for people and so you know in this place of holding the tension we have to be able to listen and have these hard conversations with each other because they're complex so um yeah i think um what t and torin said is just really a really really beneficial thanks yeah and i just want to check myself because i even this idea of being wrong uh it doesn't hold the both and agreement that we made, right? There's not a right and there's not a wrong. <laughs> and so they're coming to this value, this opinion for a reason. And we just need to help understand that and recognize that they're the one that will change their mind if that, um, you know, is meant to be. And, and, um, and all we can do is sort of support them in, in speaking our own truth. So I just want to name that. I'm sorry if I cut you off, Torin, before. I was probably a little too zealous to No, not at all. I just thought about that after as you were speaking and was inspired by what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we, I, I want to respect everyone's time. And um, Sean Liverman, we have a, a like special invite from Eric Ting, the artistic director, to join our panel next week <laughs> where they'll be talking about ex exactly um, what your question is lifting up. And then Addie, I'd love to connect with you afterwards. Um, yeah, so I just wanna, on the, the, what, I think that's a great conversation or a question to end on. Um, and God, also just like, it's not exactly what Torin was, say, Torin was saying, but also like learning how to be wrong, like over and over and over again and not internalize it, right? As actually be like grateful for that feedback. And we are being asked to share resources and share power right now. And um, you know, it is a beautiful thing to do the work, to be able to do that, you know, and like show up for that ask. Um, I'm gonna wrap us up. We are at time and um, you know, we just want to respect that for folks. Uh, we didn't get to everything and also just inviting everyone to sort of like release the perfectionism of what we didn't cover and sort of forgive ourselves for not, you know, do, doing the things we wanted to. I feel like the conversation was really valuable. Um, JD, I'm going to ask you to lead us in just a close out breath and then we'll um, wrap it up just with the quick closing um, San Quentin action, and then everyone is free to go. Thank you for folks who've um, been around. So bringing the attention to the body, noticing if there's any feelings, sensations arising in the body, heart, mind, and just allowing it all to be there with no need for it to look a certain way, to feel a way, just allowing the messiness, the compost, if you will, of our conversation this evening 
to be available to blossom and to take root. And the invitation to connect to ourselves more deeply so that we may connect more intimately with each other, that we can look fully on at our conflicted legacies in this country and hold the impact that continues to this day in the hearts and minds and bodies of people we love, people we don't know, and ourselves, the impact on our own hearts and our own minds and our own families. And knowing that we interact with each other from our most healed selves, may we take the time to connect deeply with ourselves as we do this journey of connecting with each other. So taking a deep breath and releasing, connecting to the earth, all beings. And in Buddhism, we often offer the merit or the goodness of our practice for all beings. And so knowing that we are connected, may we consider the small actions that we've done today to be as if we're throwing a pebble in a pond, that these small actions that we've done may further the liberation, the particularly of black people, of indigenous people, of people who've been harmed since the founding of this country, so that we may be free from suffering and we may all be liberated. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, JD. Um, I want to give a big heartfelt thank you to all of the speakers, to our ASL interpreters, to everyone behind the scenes, and to everyone who showed up today. Um, encouraging everyone on the call, like, let this be a seed for you, right? And not the end of an inquiry. There are tons of resources. If you have questions that are unanswered, I guarantee you the answers are, are in your further inquiry in the resources that we've provided and in your own life journey. So um, just want to say that we'll be following up with an email with resources and potential distribution of the um, oh, and please just don't sign off yet. If you're here, we want to boost the hashtag Stop San Quentin Outbreak campaign. We're just going to screen share. Please copy this. Please take it in. Um, you know, we talked about like using white womanhood earlier. <laughs> like, you know, go Karen on these, you know, on the governor, on the assembly member, on the senator, right? Like, we need calls every single day to support actually just people not dying and the, and the lives of folks who are locked up right now so unjustly. Um, yeah, there's a calling script here. There are the numbers of four different folks. This is both for San Quentin and also for all the outbreaks in the state of California right now. Please take this information and act forward. That would do us justice in this conversation. Um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and take care. Good night, everyone. We're going to play some outro music and, uh, you know, carry on. Thank you so much. Bye.